In today's episode, we have a strange true crime one. A man's deathbed confession. A friendly family man. Loved by all. Gave up his 50 year secret. He was a fugitive from the biggest bank heist ever in Cleveland's history in 1969. $1.8 million in today's money was taken and it would be one of America's strangest unsolved mysteries, appearing in many police crime shows until now. Just before Thomas Randall died, his wife of nearly 40 years asked his golfing buddies and his co-workers from the dealerships where he sold cars to come by their home. They gave to say goodbye to a guy they called one of the nicest people they ever known. A devoted family man who gushed about his daughter. A golfer who never bent the rules. A friend to so many that a line stretched outside the funeral home a week later. By the time of their final visit at Randall's house in suburban Boston, the cancer in his lungs had taken away his voice. So they all left without knowing what their friend they spent countless hours swapping stories with, never told them. His biggest secret of all. For the past 50 years, he was a fugitive, wanted in one of the largest bank robberies in Cleveland's history. Living in Boston under a new name he created six months after the heist in the summer of 1969. Not even his wife or daughter knew until he told them as a deathbed confession. So after more than 50 years, authorities announced that they closed the case on one of Cleveland's biggest bank robberies. Conrad pulled off the 1969 robbery and been living in Boston under a new name until his death in May 2021. Conrad was 20 years old when the heist happened. It was considered one of the biggest bank robberies in Cleveland and Ohio history. Ted Conrad quickly figured out the security was fairly loose at the Society National Bank in Cleveland after he started as a teller in January 1969. Ted Conrad walked into his job at the Society National Bank at 127 Public Square in Cleveland as a regular teller and walked out at the end of the work week with $215,000 in a paper bag and vanished. When the bank employees returned on Monday, they realised that the money and Conrad had gone. Conrad had a two-day start on authorities and when law enforcement started asking his friends, they told them that he was a big fan of the Steve McQueen film called The Thomas Crown Affair, a movie based on a bank robbery for sport by a millionaire businessman and had bragged for years how easy it would be to take the money from the bank and even told them how he planned to do it. He told his mate, it would be so easy for me to walk out with all kinds of money. Then just a day after his 20th birthday, that July, he walked out at closing time on a Friday with a paper bag stuffed with the money from the vault. A haul worth 1.8 million in today's money. By the time the missing money was noticed, the following Monday, Conrad was flying across the country. Letters sent to his girlfriend showed made stops in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles within the first week. In one letter, he mistakenly thought he could return in seven years, when the statute of limitations expired. But once he's indicted, that was no longer true. Conrad apparently cut off contact with his entire family, including three siblings and his parents, who were divorced. Some family members eventually presumed he was dead, because so many years had passed. The bank heist in 1969 didn't capture the attention of the nation or even the city of Cleveland. Everyone else was focused on the Apollo 11 moon landing, the historic flight to the moon that took over the news stations and national press. But for John Elliott, a deputy US Marshal, it was personal. He and Conrad came from the same side of town. Elliott used to take his family to the ice cream shop where Conrad worked. They also shared the same doctor. The problem was that Conrad's head start allowed him to disappear and he was disciplined enough not to make any missteps. The last credible sighting came in October 1969 
when a Cleveland couple visiting Hawaii met a man they later realised looked very much like Conrad. US Marshal Elliot travelled across the US looking for Conrad and even after retiring in 1990, he would come in the office just about every week and pour over the files. Pete Elliott, John Elliott's son, is now the top US Marshal in Cleveland, who inherited the hunt for Conrad nearly 20 years ago. His father died in March 2020, before investigators pieced together details from Randall's obituary and signatures from his past. Then in November, Randall's family confirmed that just before he died, he told them his real identity and what he had done. Why Conrad committed the robbery has been analysed endlessly. It wasn't about the money. He always wanted to impress people. Conrad once stole a deck of cards just to prove he could. He had no fear. Investigators believe he was inspired by the 1968 movie The Thomas Crown Affair about a bank executive who got away with 2.6 million and turned the heist into a game. Conrad saw the film at least six times and copied Steve McQueen's character, driving sports cars and drinking high-end liquor, according to his friends. After the real-life robbery in Cleveland, Conrad wound up in the Boston area, where much of the movie was filmed. It's a good possibility that he chose his new first name, his alias, Thomas, based on the movie. He modelled his whole life after that movie. The man known as Thomas Randall came to existence the first week of January in 1970. Investigators had found out that when Conrad walked into a Social Security Administration office in Boston, he asked for identification number under his new name and made himself two years older. At that time, it wasn't unusual to wait until you were an adult, so his application didn't raise any red flags. With a new identification card, he was able to open a bank account, build credit and create his new life. During the 1970s, Randall worked as an assistant golf pro, giving lessons at a country club outside Boston and later becoming its manager. He spent a few winters golfing in Florida. He also met his future wife not long after arriving in Boston. They were married in 1982. Around then he began working in the car business, selling Land Rovers and Volvos at a handful of dealerships until he retired after nearly 40 years. What's not clear yet is what happened to the money. The Marshal Service is still investigating into whether he lost it early on through bad investments. While Randall and his wife Kathy lived most of their years in a pleasant Boston suburb, they filed for bankruptcy protection in 2014. Court records show they owed $160,000 in credit card debt and had few assets. His wife said that her husband was a great man and that she was still grieving. She has declined many interview requests. No one would have guessed that Randall, who was 71 when he died, was someone trying to hide from the authorities. One of the many people he became friends with over the years was an FBI agent in Boston who was an avid golfer. He never shied away from anyone on the golf course or in the car showrooms where he kept a set of clubs and swing his seven iron when sales were slow. He was described as a gentle soul, very polite and very well spoken, said Jerry Healy, who first met Randall at Woburn, Massachusetts. At the dealership, they talked daily for years. The two were among a group of five salesmen who stuck together for much of their careers. None of them ever suspected something like this in Randall's past. His former co-workers said they never heard Randall say a bad word about anybody or raise his voice. They all said he was the best golfer they had ever known. Everyone wanted him on their side, especially when there was a tournament. He wasn't much of a drinker and never put any side bets on while playing. They remembered he could always control his emotions and rarely he ever got upset. Even on the course where he had such a great swing that he once bested Hall of Fame golfer John Miller at a charity event. In the early days after Randall's identity was revealed, 
His friends couldn't believe it, but now looking back, there are a few things that make sense. He always had a beard. The photos of him wearing dark sunglasses on the golf course. His reluctance to talk about where he grew up or his extended family. All of his friends agreed that what happened long ago hasn't changed how they feel about him. A friend of his said, the man I knew didn't change all of a sudden because of something he did a lifetime ago. He was a good man. He was my friend. And I think no less of him today than I did when all this came out. And I'd love to go and play another round of golf with him. Even though law enforcement chased leads all over the country looking for Conrad, eventually the case went cold and forgotten. Only once in a while, for a show link, America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, would he get some airtime. As you notice, know, States Marshals from Cleveland, Ohio made a break in the 52 year old case and travelled to Boston, Massachusetts, where they possibly identified Thomas Randell of Linfield, Massachusetts as a fictitious name of Conrad. He'd been living an unassuming life in the Boston suburbs since 1970. Detectives spotted the same parent's name in the obituary from the 20 year old man in 1960 to the same man in a different name decades later. It's an incredibly strange case. And if he was caught, what would his sentence be? Ted Conrad was never convicted or ever faced trial for his crimes and he never will. <laughs>